I am ending in New Hope a kind of a, a series that we're doing where we explore the book of Acts. We went all the way from Acts 1 all the way, and we're ending in Acts 27 and 28, talking about the church, right? And it was called, This is How We Do It. You know, this is how we do church. This is how we do the things within the church, and there are very specific little things that go along with being a church body and being the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. Now we are getting out of the book of Acts at, in, at Lomita, and, we're, and I was praying for months and months about where to go. So I said, okay, I like to do book studies. So we're going to go to the very beginning uh, in Genesis. And so Genesis is very, very interesting. It's the beginning of times. In the beginning, God. That is the whole book of Genesis. If you want to think about what's the main thing of Genesis, in the beginning, God. And then you have these families that are dysfunctional. <laughs> All of them. You know. Even the, the mighty men of God, the mighty women of God represented in there, all of them, excuse me, that's what I use this word, are jacked up. They got problems. We got problems. The family, the body, of, even if we, we call ourselves the body of Christ, in the fellowship, in our unit family, you have problems in your unit family. And then you go to your church body right here, Bethany. You got problems. Then we get to the assembly. We got problems. And then you get to the, the body of Christ as a whole. Yeah. Uh -uh. It ain't working. So one of the themes throughout, or the missed themes, that throughout the book of Genesis is communication. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel that the communication is because every time God comes down or speaks to one of the, one of the prophets, one of the patriarchs, matriarchs, he speaks to, he communicates to them. But sometimes that communication, it just stays there. It doesn't go anywhere. It just, it just stays right there with the person, and then years later, all of a sudden, maybe they move, maybe they don't. So, would you please, I know we've been playing up and down again, that's all right. Would you please stand with me and turn in your Bibles to Genesis. We're going to start in chapter 15 this morning. Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to, we're going to speedway through all the way to chapter 18, all right? We do this in reference for the Word of God, so this is the Word of God to His people. Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6, it says this, The Word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what... What can you give me since I remain childless? And, and the one who will inherit my estate, Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my own household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Uh, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed he, he, he believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated in the presence of God. 
So the book of Genesis, we have five families, per se. There are lots of families in the book of Genesis, but we have five primary families. Five is the number of grace. Okay? Grace. Five. And you need a whole lot of grace in the book of Genesis. You need a whole lot of grace here in our families. Amen? Talk to me, y'all. Amen? Amen. In my years as a, a marriage and family therapist, I, um, as an intern and, a, and as, as in my studies, I've come to realize that no family is perfect. I try to look for it, believe me. I try, I try to look at it. Every family, they come in, yes, we're, we're here for therapy. Oh, you're here for therapy. Okay, have a seat. Yes. We're not perfect. Amen. Okay, let's try to fix it. All families have what we call gradations of sin or gradations of dysfunction. Gradation of, of sin is like, a, I say gradations because you can have a little sin or you can have a lot of sin. You know, you can have a little evil, you can have a lot of evil. I'll give you an example. You steal a stapler from the, from the office, right? That's, that's a little bit. You, you, you execute millions of people like math. That's a lot. You understand? So in between all of that, we fall. The gradations of sin. Gradations of dysfunction, too. You see, the thing about dysfunction is that we don't like to talk about it. I, we don't like to talk about it. Our family, oh, yeah, we're good. We're fine. Everything's, everything's all right. Everything's all right. Jeremiah 14, 20, it says this, Lord, we confess our wickedness. And that of our ancestors, too. Not just our, but our ancestors. We have all sinned against you, God. And then we have our famous passage going from the Old Testament to the New Testament in Romans 3, verses 23 through 26. We always do verse 23, but I want to read the whole thing in its context so you understand. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. You've heard this, right? Let's go on. Yet God in his, uh-oh, there's that word again, grace. But God in his grace freely makes us in his, right in his sight. He did this through who? Jesus. Come on, we say Jesus' name all the time. He did this through who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Jesus. When he freed us from the penalty of our sin. I like to say, and dysfunction. Of our dysfunction. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. You see, there is the gospel message right there. Yeah. Mm. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair. Hey, we God is fair? It's amazing. I'm reading the New Living Translation, but still, God is fair. God is just. God is fair. Interesting concept. When he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. Not just us in this time, but in times past. Also in times in the future, right? Mm -hmm. For he was looking ahead to include them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. He accounted for righteousness because Abraham believed God. He believed God. But this dysfunction, you see, that we have is something that we try to cover up. We don't want people to know. It's like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm good. I don't need you. I don't need anyone. I don't need this church. I don't need therapy. I don't need nothing. I don't need God. I don't need him. Do you see the progression that just happened there? You went from... I'm okay. So I don't need God. 
dysfunction. Pride. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the grace, the grace, the grace that he supplied to us. You see, graces can be spelled out like this. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Amen. Just like we read there in Romans 3. Grace. <coughs> So you turn that, oh, I'm okay, and I don't need you, and I don't need anybody, and I don't need the church, and I don't need God. And you come back, you see, and to the response that it should be, <clears throat> I'm not okay. I need you. I, I need you. From I don't need anybody to I need you. I, I need to heal. If, if I were to say that in this, in this body right here and say, would you put your hands up if you need to heal, everybody's hands should go up. That's right. Everybody. That's right. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I, I need my brothers. I, I need my sisters. I, I need the church. Yes. I need the body of Christ. That's right. I need God. Amen. Amen. You see it? The difference there? Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, going back to Genesis here. You have five families. You have Adam. I'll call the family of Adam. Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. What happened in their family? What happened that was dysfunctional? Murder. Cain and Abel. Killed. Cain killed Abel. Over, some, over a sacrifice. That he knew wasn't acceptable. That he had been told what to do. This is what they did. But Cain said, no, nah, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to do something different. And then, well, you know the story. I'm not going to go on that. Then you have Noah. <laughs> Family dysfunction. They go and they, they get on the ark, everything, and the flood and all the stuff. They get off, sacrifice, everything is good. I went through the story just like that, okay? <laughs> follow me? You follow me? You went through the story, had to, uh, got out, okay, Noah got a little drunk. And then... His grandson came out and was looking at his being drunk, and the curse goes. Just, wow. The Lord curse people. You're not going to do well. You're a curse. Dysfunction. Then we got Abraham. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we'll talk about it. We're going to focus on Abraham. We're going to go past him and go to Isaac. Even Isaac. <laughs> Deception with Jacob and Esau, right? Mm -hmm. They get into the mix and it's okay, mom comes out, okay, you gotta lie, you gotta say this and that and this and that. And then causes dysfunction there. And, and then we got Jacob. Whole bunch of problems. Mm -hmm. Two wives, concubines, you know, everybody's. That women are fighting each other, you know, Jacob's, uh, you know, just like, oh, I don't want to even be here, you know. <laughs> He's running from his brother Esau. So all this dysfunction, all this family, even in, in Jacob, as you go on to, to the, the sons of Jacob, the tribe, the Israelites, the Israel, they have stuff, they have rape in there. You, you got a prostitution in there. You have adultery, you have a whole bunch of problems, dysfunction, right? Well, let's focus on communication. This is one thing. We're going to take one thing this morning as we move on. A family that does not communicate is destined to 
dysfunction. Mm -hmm. A family that does not communicate is destined to dysfunction. Let's see how. Built into the human fabric is this failure to communicate. You see, we need this morning to talk about Abram, later called Abraham, the father of the faith. Okay. He, he is what we consider Father Abraham, many sons, right? Many sons have Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so were so you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right? You know, the whole song, right? That thing, we're all jumping up and down. God made a covenant. He made a covenant with this man. And Abram, like we said in verse 6, Abram believed God. Verse 6, it says in this passage, Abram believed the Lord and he accredited it to him. He, meaning God, accredited it to Abraham as righteousness. It's, it's starting the whole, it's starting the whole thing for what we consider the body of Christ. Amen? They go to Israelites, they go to the Pharaoh, and they come out, and two million people, they go and do the thing, and you know, they can, the, they worship God, they say, I don't want to worship God, and then I can go through the whole story real quick, but we're not going to do that. But this is, this is the guy, this is the cat, okay? Let's turn to Genesis 6, Genesis 16, excuse me, Genesis 16, because I want you to see what happens here in the dialogue. It's very subtle, but you can catch it and apply it. That's what we want to do this morning. So the first thing that happens is the you have Abram, Abraham, he turns into Abraham, the Lord gives it to him. The first thing that happens is the Lord performs the act of the covenant. Remember we read where God accounted him for righteousness. Now God has to demonstrate that. So what happens is that he puts Abraham, he tells Abraham to go get a whole bunch of animals, okay, and he, and he puts Abraham to sleep. And God himself comes down and walks through the covenant, making a covenant with Abraham. Abraham. And then later, after chapter 15 ends, you go into chapter 16, and then you have the story of Hagar and Sarah. Okay? And let's go there. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Now, Sarah, Abraham's, Abraham's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. She was barren. She had been an Egyptian. She had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Hmm. Interesting. Didn't the Lord tell Abram? Okay, forget it. Perhaps I can have children through her. So Abram agrees with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, uh, Abram's wife, took the Egyptian uh, Hagar servant and, and he gave her to Abram as wife. This is, I love this comment. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. 10 years, huh? But well, in chapter 15, Abram talks to God and makes the covenant 10 years. Is it, is it 10 years? Did that happen? Or it doesn't matter. What is missing? What is missing? Ladies, you have it? I think you do. I think the ladies see what is missing here. Let's move on. Guys may not, guys may not have gotten it. Don't say it, ladies. Don't tell them. You keep the secret for now. Let's continue to read. Okay, now we have the son, Ishmael. Okay, Ishmael is born. Uh, Sarah is mad. Hagar is mad. And there's all kinds of problems. But Abram is silent. God enters Abram's life again. He appears to Abram again. And he explains to him the sign of the covenant. And, and he explains to him Abram's name change to Abraham. And, but, but, but let's focus on Sarah. What does God tell Abram about Sarah? Genesis 17, Genesis 17, 15, starting at verse 15. Genesis 17, starting at verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, changed his name already, now he's Abraham. Regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai, 
Now, from now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her, guy. Not from Hagar. You messed it up the first time. And you knew it too. You just saw Hagar say, yeah, I'll be back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's a little bit younger. Now, you're beautiful too, Sarah. You're beautiful too. But you know, you, you said that you wanted me to Hagar. Yeah, okay, I can do that. I'll do that. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> that wasn't God's plan. It's Abr Abram knew that. Mm -hmm. But, okay. Verse 17. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground. He understood. He got it. He knew it. And he laughed to himself in disbelief. Uh, how can I become the father at age 100? He thought. It's interesting how God, he said he thought, like God was reading his mind. It's Abraham was doing this. <laughs> and God interpreted all of that and brought it back into context. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is nearly 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, he thought that, but this is what he said to God. May Ishmael live under your special blessing, God. We already did the thing. I know we weren't supposed to do it, but you know, here, here's Ishmael. He's born already. There are problems going on. You can take Ishmael. I know that this is not going to happen. But God replied, no. <laughs> Have you ever heard God say no? <laughs> it says it right here. No. <laughs> or maybe, or maybe you're walking and you hear the Holy Spirit. No. And you do it anyway. Or you don't do it, maybe you stop. But God said to him, no. Sarah, again. No, this is the third time that God has said this. One, two, three. Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. Then God appeases him and starts to talk about Ishmael. Because he's, this, this is my son, Ishmael. Through Hagar, but he's my son. What is going to happen to Ishmael? Let Ishmael live before you. No. But this is what I'm going to do for Ishmael. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also, just, to, just as you have asked. You see, God was listening. You see, th this, is the, this, this is the communication that we're talking about. God, God will come and he will uh, talk to you. He will communicate with you. He will show you. That is his character. And he wants us to do the same. But no. So after all this happens and God tells him again what's going on, what does Abraham do? Then, as God told him to do, Abraham went and got every male in the house and had them circumcised as God requires. That's the end of chapter 17. <laughs> Wait, something is missing here. Something is being lost in communication. Gentlemen, <coughs> ladies, do we know? Hmm. God, you should be getting a clue now. But let's go on. Let's go on. The Lord shows up with two angels, right? He's on his way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be done. Abram sees him from afar off and says, hey, Lord recognizes him. Come to my home. Please stop right here. Let me make you some food and we'll kill the fatted calf and we're going to do it up and you're going to have, we're going to have some great conversation. This is chapter 18. So Abraham gets the food, prepares it. 18 verse 9 through 15. See, we're running fast. We're running fast. Genesis 18. Here we go. Verse 9. Where is Sarah? Uh-oh. 
He called him. God called Sarah by her new name. Where's Sarah, your wife? And God makes it really clear who he's talking about. You need a little, a little uh, no, 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 no. Sarah, your wife, the visitors ask. She's inside the tent. She can hear our conversation. Abraham replied. Then one of them said, here it is. This is the fourth time. I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. So this is the fourth time Abraham knew that he had messed up because his wife is listening in on the conversation. If I were him, I would have said, God, not now. Can we go to the other tent and talk about Sarah? <laughs> please, please, not now. But Sarah's listening, right? Sarah was listening to the conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both, now it goes into a little narrative here, so you can just know that they are old. Okay? This is the whole thing. Sarah and Abraham were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed. She laughed like she didn't know. She didn't know. He didn't communicate. She had been this whole time, this whole time trying to, trying to make it happen. But he didn't tell her. He didn't communicate. Abraham, I can just see right now. Oh, God. God, no, I, don't, I didn't tell her to stop. So she laughed. Silently to herself and said, she wouldn't have said this if he had told her. How could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also old? <laughs> She's over there, check this out. She's over there listening, right? I'm going to have a baby. But if he would have told her the first, second, third, she wouldn't have been laughing. <laughs> she wouldn't have known. Yeah. See, what we have here is a failure to communicate. That's right. mm -hmm. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Abram, you know, he didn't say to Sarah. The Lord knew what was going on. This is, this is, this is genuine. This shows the grace of God. This right here, this chapter, um, chapter 18, verses 13 and 14, shows the grace of God in the context of, of Genesis and the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Then the Lord said to Abram, not Sarah. Why did Sarah laugh? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't tell her 10 years ago that this was going, that it was going down like this. Uh, but I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, don't tell you that you didn't know. You knew. I told you, bro. <laughs> Why did she laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Mm. And then he says it again. This is the fifth time, which is what? Grace. <laughs> Thank you. This is grace. He says it again. He says it again. Is there anything? I will return about next time this year and Sarah will have a son. I'm serious. Y'all believe me. And Sarah was afraid. Could you blame her? She had just heard this information. Now look, I'm, I'm, this is what the word says. This is exegesis. Okay, I'm, I'm bringing what the word says out. I, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to add. I'm just reading the story the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. So Sarah was afraid, and she denied. And she denied. Said, "Oh, I, I didn't laugh." And he said, "But the Lord says, gracious are gracious, Father." No, but she did laugh. <laughs> he did. He 
just called her on it. He did. He didn't say, and you will go to hell, you know, <laughs> and you will. No, he just said, you're ready to laugh. He did. He did it. Abraham, wait, see, Lord, uh, uh, I forgot to tell Sarah about the baby. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot to tell her about her name change. <laughs> Yeah, and I forgot to tell her about the covenant. I just, I, I didn't communicate. She would not have been afraid if she had known what was coming. You know, I, I'm going to get very personal here and tell you that there are many times that I do not tell Rob what is coming. Anybody else? Man, Mary? <laughs> right, Pastor, you don't know the honest man in here. <laughs> Me and you, bro, we're here. Is, is there, hey, you know, well, honey, yeah, I went out, um, I bought this instrument. You, you guys know I, I like to leave worship. I bought this, uh, I, didn't, I didn't tell you. And she goes up to the doing the bill. Hey! <laughs> honey! It's usually a phone call because I'm away from the house, right? <laughs> Um, I see a charge here for X amount of dollars. Is that you? Yeah, you see, what had happened was, <laughs> um, yeah, that's me. It, it works out a lot better if you tell me. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's the same issue here. Same thing. Reverse it. Honey, those shoes look nice. <laughs> what? That's a. Uh... Huh, they got the red bottoms too? <laughs> and that. What is that? Those cost like $1,500. <laughs> right? That's a nice dress you got on. You realize that it's coming out of the account. Mm -hmm. Just dealing with money. Just say it. Just say it. <laughs> okay, man. The men, listen, ladies. Don't listen. <laughs> okay, man. Who should be the head of communication in the household? Men. Just, just answer to yourself. Don't say. Okay, ladies, take the, you're, you're, you're here and now. Ladies, who should be the head of communication in the household? Oh, somebody said it. Who was that? If I had candy, I would throw it to you. <laughs> it's both of yous. Both of yous. I know it's incorrect English. Believe me, I've had years of college. Both of yous. The both of you communicate. You are, both of you are the head of communication in the household. I didn't say headship. Don't get me wrong. When it comes to responsibility, the man takes the responsibility of the household. It, this is not, it's, and it's not guys like, yeah, well, you know, I'm the head of the household. No, you are the head of responsibility of the household. That means when the stuff goes down, it's on you. That's right. Don't get it twisted. And then from there, if you accept that responsibility, you are head. Yeah. And your first responsibility is to die. Uh-oh. <laughs> you mean I, my first responsibility is in sitting down and, <laughs> and watching television? No. It's to die. <laughs> as Jesus died for the church. And to secondly, wash your wife with the water of the what? Word. That's right. When it comes to communication, it's the both of you. You see, what happens is the man tries to communicate and if he gets shut down so much because he's not doing it right. real silent, Pastor Bill. 
So he just stops trying. My wife shuts me down all the time. I ain't going to communicate anymore. I'm not saying that's your situation. I'm not saying that. I, but if the shoe fits, or in my church we say, if you can't say a man, say ouch. <laughs> you see, what happens is the woman tries to communicate. First of all, the man trying to communicate, right? Now, it's the woman who's trying to communicate, and the man stops listening to the details, and he tunes out, causing dysfunction in the house. Mm -hmm. that, that is also a two thing. It's a twofer. It's not just one person responsible. I'm not saying that's your situation, but if the shoe fits, wear it. Own up to it. How can you communicate effectively so you don't get into dysfunction? Now this, I'm not, I can, I can talk about the family, and I can talk about husband and wife, but this is for everybody. Amen. You see, it's for singles, <laughs> it's for widows, widowers, it is for the church, it is for husband and wife. <clears throat> it's a family, everybody has a family, even though we try to, try to get away from them a lot, especially during this season. But the family, the church, the assembly, the body of Christ. Everybody has a part. So our challenge for today is to communicate effectively as God communicated to Abraham, but not as Abraham communicated to Sarah. You understand? Mm -hmm. Let me give you some suggestions as we're getting ready to close. Some practical applications. And these are not the usual application scriptures. I try to find some that you could, um, just verses, one verses that you can just link on to and remember. Some of, some of them are a little obscure, and, but, but it's good. Because we know the ones like... Um, from Ephesians, husbands love your wives, the wives submit to your husbands. We know that. We know the first Corinthians, you know, the love chapter 13. You know, we, we know those. But there's some that are just boom, they hit you. So your first practical application is to talk to each other. Talk to each other. How do we do that? Colossians 4 6. Talking about your conversation. Colossians 4, 6. Now, note that Paul is writing this, and he is at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the jails. With some say theses running by him, because it was the very pit where all the stuff from the community would end up, and it would be at the bottom of the jail. So he's there <coughs> writing this. It's an amazing thought. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive. <laughs> I love it. Let your conversation, when you communicate, because you are going to communicate, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone, including your husband, including your children, including that relative, including that coworker, including that school person, including, including everyone. You communicate. You see? Next, Ephesians 4, 29. Again, concerning speech. Lord, help us. Don't use foul, foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. So that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them? A foul or abusive language. Man, I've heard it in the therapy room. Now, when it's in the therapy room, you know that it's happening. Some of the most godly people who come to church, 
I'm sorry, I, I can say this because I'm in somebody else's church, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most godly people are in the parking lot. Somebody was telling me, yeah. Get out. Boom. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Pastor. <laughs> Weren't y'all two just arguing in the parking lot? With a smile. You see the smile? You're busted. I don't say that. I just smile. And I say good morning. And I look at the husband and I look at the wife. And I say, if y'all need to come see me, come on. I'll be here after service. Don't use foul or abusive language. Foul language, we know what they are, you know, the words and the stuff that you use to adorn and color your speech when you're talking to your partner or you're talking to your kids. But what about the abusive language? The one that says, you know, you're no, you're no good. You were never no good. My mama told me not to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> or, I don't even know why I got married. Oh. You just drive me nuts. I can't stand being around you. Am I hitting it? Abusive. But be good. Be helpful. Use words that will encourage each other. Next, Proverbs 25, 11. Timely advice is lovely, like golden apples in a silver basket. Timely advice. When I think of that word, it's timely. 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 What does that mean? Don't say something stupid in the wrong time. <laughs> there, there's, there's, there's a time and a place for everything, right? Ecclesiastes. And your timing has got to be impeccable. In jazz, I love jazz, listen to jazz. And um, um, I'm a trumpet player, so sometimes, you, you know, I get an opportunity to play and, and, and to do all that stuff. And the time, if you're not, if you're mm -hmm. it's got to be time. If it's not in time, it don't work. <laughs> you, you, you hear me? Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't work. It's got to be boom. Your language, your speech, what comes out of your mouth in the time that it comes out. Don't be saying something stupid when you, when you know it's not in context. That's right. Say it later. When it's harsh, say it later. And say it gracefully. Yeah. You know, honey, that was, we got to do that better. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're in the middle of the ball. <laughs> yeah, you want some silence? Say that to your partner. You will get some silence. You may never get a sound back. You better be careful. Say it in the right time. Next one, listen to each other. Yeah. James 1, 19. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen, mm -hmm. slow to speak, and slow to get angry. I love this. God listened. He listened to Abram. Let, let Ishmael live before you, God. And he addressed him. Uh, Ishmael's going to be cool, too. Yeah, of course, he's going to have fights against Isaac, and that's going to be a mess, even to this day. But I hear you, Abram. I hear you. I Abraham inclined his ear. No, excuse me. God, excuse me. God inclined his ear to Abraham. Listen. Incline your ear to that person. You see, when you are quick to listen, you're anxious to listen. I, 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 I try to have this with my wife. I, she's, um, she comes home, she's uh, tired from work, she's been teaching the kiddies, you know, and the kiddies are jacked up, and everybody, <laughs> and the, the administration's messed up, and the parents calling and stuff like that. Every, when she comes home, I listen. 
And I don't listen like this. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm. mm hmm mm hmm Well, she's right here. See what this is? The block. She ain't listening. This is listening. <laughs> what? Really? That's listening. Response. Even if, even if you're. It's still listening. I, I didn't do it for you. I got to do something for y'all. So my wife, you got to sit over here next time. <laughs> Listen to each other. Listen, be quick to listen. Quick, anxious to grasp it, to get the, the gist of what they are trying to say. It goes both ways, men and women. You see, it, I'm not just talking about man to woman. I, I'm talking about woman to man. Yes. Listen to your husband. That's right. Even if he ain't saying nothing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, you awake? Yeah, yeah, I was awake. Why'd you turn the channel? <laughs> Honey, can I get you something? Uh, when it, oh my goodness, my heart melts when my wife at, uh, tell her, Honey, can I get you something? Wow, yeah! <laughs> uh, some cold water, <laughs> uh, slippers, you know? That, it's, you're listening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When your kid tells you something, when, you're, when your child comes to you, you don't dismiss it. You come and you listen to them. I, that, I can say I want to, I want a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, you can't have a cookie right now. Yeah, you want a cookie. Okay, we'll do this and this and this, and then later we'll get a cookie. <laughs> right? Next, love each other. It was just one for, for listen to each other. That, that was the key one. Love each other as we close. Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. I skipped one, guys. So. Ephesians 4.32. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Love is forgiveness. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that separates love from forgiveness. Love is forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's right. God forgave us. That's right. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Forgive, forgive, forgive. If you can't forgive, you can't love. <laughs> Let me say that again. If you can't forgive, you can't love. That's right. Think of the people that you need to forgive. Forgiveness is for you. Mm -hmm. Ain't for them. Mm -hmm. Even if they've abused you beyond abusive language, you need to forgive because if you do not forgive, after it says, oh, your heavenly father won't forget you. That's what the word says. I, I, I'm just a relayer of the word. Look it up for yourself. Philippians 4, 8, as we close. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. With your communication, if you do this, you will draw people as your family, as your church, as your assembly, as the body of Christ, to God. You want to draw them to God. Because the word of God says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men Amen. to me. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our time.